I think we are going to get started. And if a couple people join us later, then they can kind of catch up. Um, I, again, want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Heidi, and I am the lead librarian at the Holton and Montague branches of the Muskegon Area District Library. Um, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you tonight. Um, we have partnered with the White Lake Music Society and are very pleased to present a virtual version of their winter lecture series, which has been happening for many years um, up in the White Lake area. So we're very, very excited that we could do this uh, virtually. Um, before we begin, um, I do wanna take just a couple of seconds to give you some details um, about tonight's program. Um, we will have a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So you are welcome to type your questions into the chat box if you would like to at any point during, during the presentation, um, or you can wait until the end and you will be able to unmute yourselves at that point and you can actually ask um, Laura or Bob your question. Um, we um, also um, have muted everyone right now. Um, I think I might've already mentioned that. So you will not be able to unmute yourselves um, until later on in the show. Um, and if you miss anything um, tonight or know of somebody who was not able to attend tonight who might be interested in this um, presentation, uh, we will be posting this uh, recording on the Mattel YouTube channel um, later on um, you know, after, after the event. So, so look for that on the Mattel YouTube channel. So now I'd like to turn the program over to um, this evening's moderator from the White Lake uh, Music Society, Bob Swan, and uh, he will introduce our speaker tonight. Take it away, Bob. Well, hello everyone. I'm Bob Swan and I'm what they call the artistic advisor for the White Lake Music Society and the White Lake Music Festival. And now in partnership with uh, the Muskegon Area District Libraries, we are presenting this uh, winter lecture series. Um, we are so pleased to have as our initial le lecturer for this year's uh, series, Laura Kosischke, a wonderful poet and novelist, who, some of whose novels have been, three no of her novels have been made into movies. So she is um, a very, very talented woman and I've enjoyed reading her poetry as I've come across it. So without yakking any further, let me just turn the, the evening over to Laura Kosischke. Let's welcome her. Thank you, thank you so much. So am I uh, visible and audible and, but you're all muted so you can't tell me? Uh, text yes. me if I'm not. <laughs> okay. You, I am. You're visible, yes. It's good? Oh, good, all right. Well, thanks so much. I am so grateful to Bob Swan for inviting me and I've also enjoyed talk, talking to him and getting to know him and hope that uh, one day I can meet you all in person and thank you to the library so much for having me. Um, it's a great thing to, I mean, I would rather be there, I would rather see you, but at least we're holding a place for poetry in the meantime. And thanks very much to you. So I wanted to read, uh, I want to read some poetry by some people besides myself uh, to get started. I um, thought that I, my theme, at first I was going to talk quite a bit about Jean Valentine who died in December at age 86, a wonderful poet. So uh, her poems are so mystical and dreamlike. And she said uh, that one of her college teachers gave her this tremendous gift telling her, oh, you could write from your dreams. And that's what she did. She did write from her dreams. Her poems are dreamlike for that reason, but they also speak to time and place and to, um, I mean, she was 86 and wrote her whole life really. And I believe, um, you know, uh, was a kind of documentary maker in poetry or in dream of all that's happened to us. in I suppose the last 60 years, I don't think she was writing poetry when she was in kindergarten or anything. And I was so sad that she died at the end of December because I was hoping that she would have 
um, a way to bring us some poetry to, you know, to the future to I, I don't like thinking of her having left the world in the way it was at the end of December. I like to think of her having lived long enough to see us out of lockdown and together. And um, she's very much uh, someone who praises in more her prose, maybe, and when I've heard her speak, the value of unity, of people coming together, of caring about each other, about empathy. And um, the poetry doesn't speak directly to that. But what I wanted to start out by saying is that poetry doesn't speak directly to very many of our issues that we're getting from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or CNN or whatever your news source is. And certainly not social media with our sound bites and our our arguments. Um, instead, it speaks to. I, I mean, there's been so much talk about um, false facts and you know true lies <laughs> in the last couple of years. And I just wanted to pitch for poetry that, as William Carlos Williams said, uh, uh, you can't get the I'm not quoting directly here, but I'm kind of, kind of uh, making it more colloquial. Uh, we can't get the news from poetry, but people die every day for want of what is written there. And um, that there's the poetry that has lasted for decades and centuries and from its origins in, the language that is really only in our minds because poetry had to have been created, thought of, invented um, before people could write. It's prehistoric. It's a prehistoric uh, art form. It's to make things memorable. It's to pass things on. It's to say our time and place is not the only time and place. And what we are feeling now is not these are not the only important feelings and the only important experiences people have had, but that instead we're, we're going forward, we're carrying on, we're speaking to the generations that will come after us in poetry, and we're reading in poetry the generations that came before us. So anyway, because Bob made me think of Rilke um, when we were talking I thought that I would read this poem from the Book of Hours. It's uh, translated by Anita Barrows and Joanna Macy. And if you read poetry and translation, you know that the poems are always a, a little bit different. Uh, this it's 11.25, they're all untitled, but I thought this would speak maybe a little bit to our day and time. All will come again into its strength, the fields undivided, the waters undammed, the trees towering and the walls built low. And in the valleys, people as strong and buried as the land. And no churches where God is imprisoned and lamented like a trapped and wounded animal. The houses welcoming all who knock and a sense of boundless offering in all in all relations. That was a Freudian slip, retaliation. In all relations and in you and me. No yearning for an afterlife, no looking beyond, no belittling of death, but only longing for what belongs to us and serving earth, lest we remain unused. So thank you, Bob, for making me think of Rilke. Now I will read a poem by the poet I was speaking of, Jean Valentine, whose work I highly suggest that you find. Um, it's spelled her Jean is J-E-A-N and Valentine is just like the holiday that's coming up. Um, I might read to you first what she wrote about the poem that I'm gonna read. Uh, it, it, she said of it in, uh, when she had to write a little thing and it won Best American Poetry six years ago or so. 1945 was, of course, the last year of World War II. Many of the military all over the world were sent or made their way back to their countries. Many, if not all of them, 
as in this poem, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So that is uh, the inspiration for the poem. Sorry, I have another one marked here too. Oh, I forgot my alphabet. Sorry, alphabetical order. <laughs> 1945 by Jean Valentine. The winter trees offer no shade, no shelter. They offer wood to the family of wood. He comes in at the kitchen door, waving like a pistol, a living branch in his hand. He shouts, man, your battle stations. Our mother turns to the kitchen curtains. He shakes the branch, a house sized great dipper points north over the yard. Can it help? How about the old dog thumping her tail? Whose dog is that? How about the old furnace breathing? Breathing the world. A flyer, a diver, kitchen curtains, veterans, God. Listen, kindness. We're in this thing like leaves. I Every time I come to the end of that poem, I always feel that she is going to write um, we're in this thing together, but how strange and magical and also more, well, more physical, more sensory, and what a way to bring us together. If we are like leaves, we are all in this like leaves. Well, the branch has been compared to a pistol, the man who's being watched by a child, I believe, is... Um, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And we're all the lead. We aren't in this together. We don't, you know, we aren't uh, a, a, a shouting mob. We are like leaves on that branch in the, in the mind and in the experience of this man who um, I assume is the father and who loves his daughter, uh, but he's scaring her. So I just wanna read that last part again. A flyer, a diver, kitchen curtains, veterans, God, listen, kindness, we're in this thing like leaves. The fragility of life and how massively it can be changed by time and politics and at the same time that we're so um, vulnerable to the world, we're also, we're in it. We're in it, we're in it like leaves. We're not going to be here forever, but we, well, I'm just now I'm putting words in to the, I don't like explaining poems very much, but I just feel that there's so much there that speaks to our time and place. And um, uh, the, this idea that we, we're trying, we've tried so hard for almost a year now to hang on so dearly for life. And we're hanging, you know, many people are hanging on, many people are just about to fall off, but we're all in it together, like, but like leaves, not like cinder blocks and not like uh, an army, but like the observer of the armies. And then I wanted to read uh, another poem from the same book because I just happened upon it when I was looking for Jean Valentine. And James Tate uh, is a poet I also love a lot. This poem is, I'll show you, it's a prose poem, which many times people ask, well, why isn't it in lines if it's a poem? But it's, I believe, because of the story uh, genre form of this poem is very important to it. And uh, he died three years ago or four years ago. Time is passing so quickly. I don't know anymore, but he did not, he opted not to in the back of the book, um, unless he passed away by then, uh, he had not uh, written about what is this poem about, but I think that it speaks for itself. So I'm gonna read this for you. The baby. I said, I'm afraid you go into the woods at night Please don't make me go into the woods. But somebody has stolen our baby and has taken it into the woods. You must go, she said. We don't have a baby, Cynthia. How many times must I tell you that? I said, we don't. I felt certain that we had a baby, she said. 
We will have one soon. I feel certain of that, I said. Then it makes no sense for you to go into the woods at night without a baby to search for. What would you do, she said. I'm going to stay right here by the fire where it's cozy and safe, I said. I'm going to go put the baby to bed, she said. Someday there will be a baby, I said. Until then, I'll put him to bed, she said. Have it your way, I said. She went out of the room, humming a little ditty. I put a log on the fire and lay down on the couch. Cynthia came running into the room screaming, the baby is gone, someone has stolen our baby. I never liked that baby, I'm glad it's gone and I'm going into the woods. Don't even think of asking me, I said. A fine father you turned out to be, my precious baby eaten by wolves, she said. I think in that poem, I find uh, the humor is in the obviously ongoing domestic conflict between the two of them, the absurdity of the situation, or it's bordering on um, a break with reality and uh, the blame inherent in it. He's talking about a baby in the future that they have not yet had, and yet they're continually going into the future with a child who does not yet exist. And yet the father has, the mother has already lost the child to the wolves and the father has already um, proven himself to be an unfit parent. <laughs> so uh, let me, I think I am gonna just read a couple more things because um, there's, well, I have a lot of books and uh, and it's fun to read other people's poetry sometimes. And uh, I appreciate your listening to this. This is a poem by a poet who's become, he's, I mean, poetry, I don't know how old he is, maybe 30 or so, Mike White, um, but that's very young for a poet. Poetry is the elixir of youth. As a poet, you can still be young um, when you're 70. Uh, as an ice skater, you are over with, but he, I, so I don't know how old he is, but he's a new poet to me. And uh, well, he, his book picture makes him look kind of young. So, and I read this poem in a journal and then I immediately bought his book because I loved this poem so much. And then I learned that all the poems in the book are as good as this little poem. It's a Halloween poem. So it's not completely timely, but uh, I, I think you will appreciate it. It's called Angel. I was out of candy. It said, my halo blowed off. My wings is really for pretend. My boots is not the kind they wear except when it's raining. It said, I seen your light. And I'm going to read it one more time. It, that's the whole poem is very short. And then uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, I have this poem memorized, but I won't recite it because then I will forget it. Angel, I was out of candy. It said, my halo blowed off. My wings is really for pretend. My boots is not the kind they wear except when it's raining. It said, I seen your light. And I imagine that this poem can be read on two levels. One, it's Halloween. A child has come to the door in an angel costume that has gotten raggedy and, uh, fallen apart and the, you know, we all know on Halloween, if you don't uh, leave your light on, that means you're out of candy, but someone has left his light on. He is out of candy, but this angel has appeared because on the other side of that, you can read the poem as an actual angel saw this man's light, the man's out of candy, but the angel has not said why it has appeared yet. It's ragged, it's mostly for pretend, but um, it was called to by the late. I, I won't, I'll try not to wax too poetic by saying that to me in some ways that speaks as a kind of ars poetica, a poem about writing poetry. You know, the how many poets have said that, uh, the muse doesn't show up every day, but I'm going to be sitting there waiting for it in case it does. Well, uh, there was nothing to give the angel, but the point was the visitation, the visitation and the welcoming and the acceptance of this visitor, which is indicated by the light being left on. And I think 
you know, I've had just, I'm feeling a lot of empathy for all of us, um, socially isolating at this time and place, but also, you know, we're leaving the light on, we're leaving the light on and we're going to be here hopefully at the end of it to, um, embrace each other more than we have maybe been able to or even willing to do um, until recently. Well, now I will read some of my poems, but then at the, um, maybe I'll interrupt them a little bit with, uh, by reading uh, some poems that have been important to me in the writing of my own poems. Let me, I, the title of this poem more or less tells you what the poem is about. Um, and so does the first line. Uh, so there's no suspense in this poem. Um, so I'm not gonna, I think this poem is uh, self-explanatory. Um, I will just tell you that uh, it's a true story. For the young woman I saw hit by a car while riding her bike. I'll tell you up front, she was fine although she left in an ambulance because I called 911. And what else can you do when they come for you with their sirens and lights and you're young and polite, except get into their ambulance and pretend to smile? Thanks, she said to me before they closed her up. They even tucked her bike in there, not one bent spoke on either tire. But I was shaking and sobbing too hard to say goodbye. I imagined her telling her friends later, it hardly grazed me but this lady who saw it went crazy. I did, I was molecular. Well, even the driver who hit her did little more than roll his eyes. While a trucker stuck at the intersection, wolfing down a swan sandwich behind the wheel side. Someone touched me on the arm and asked, are you all right? Over in 10 seconds, she stood all blonde, shook her wings like a little cough. Are you okay? Someone else asked me uneasily, as if overhearing my heartbeat and embarrassed for me that I was made of such gushing meat in the middle of the day on a quiet street. They should have put her in the ambulance, not me. Laughter, shit happens, to be young, to shrug it off. But ah, sweet thing, take pity. One day you too may be an accumulation of regrets, catastrophe, a clay animation of Psalm 73. But as for me, my feet, no, it will be Psalm 48. They saw it and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Today you don't remember the way you called my name so desperately a thousand times, tearing your hair and your clothes on the floor and the nurse who denied your morphine so that you had to die that morning under a single sheet without me in agony. But this time I was beside you, I waited and I saved you. I was there. Um, the past and the future and the impulse to um, reach into the past by over helping um, a young woman who's probably still paying off her ambulance bill. I didn't ask for her name or give her mine before uh, I called 911 and she was quite fine. Um, but you can never be too safe. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but, and this poem might be somewhat uh, along the same, in the same sort of vein. Uh, I'm gonna begin with a, a couple of grief poems and then uh, hopefully lead up to the uh, uh, happier poems. The Call of the One Duck Flying South. This actually, this poem, the title of it, caused my husband and I to have a very small argument um, because he was insisting that geese are are the only, well, the fowls that we would be seeing flying in a V. And um, I was able to convince him by showing him some ducks in a V that actually ducks also fly in a, in a V. Um, so I was allowed to keep my title instead of a goose, it's a duck, which was actually pretty important in the poem because goose just didn't sound right. The call of the one duck flying south. So far behind the others in their neat little V, 
in their competence of plans and wings. If you didn't listen, you would think it was a cry for help or sympathy, friends, friends, but it isn't. Silence of the turtle on its back in the street, silence of the polar bear pulling its wounded weight onto the ice, silence of the antelope with a broken leg, silence of the old dog asking for no further explanation. How was it I believed I was God's favorite creature? I who carry my feathery skeleton across the sky now, calling out for all of us. I who am doubt now with a song. I hope I'm not the only one who has noticed that over and over again, the, um, the duck or the goose or any kind of flying fowl um, can keep up with the V it's back behind the other ones. And what is, what is that um, call about? Well, I, uh, whoop, I just cracked my book. Um, I live in Chelsea, Michigan and um, I don't know if you've been through here. We've been famous for the Common Grill and the Purple Rose Theater and uh, Jeff Daniels, the movie star living here. I hope these things are uh, still going to be here in a few more weeks um, or months when we can return to them. But we also have a clown in Chelsea and her name is Colors the Clown. And uh, I have not seen her in a while, although of friend of my son's, not my son's friend, but my son's friend's father dated Colors the Clown for a little while, um, which I thought would be very interesting because she's a clown. She goes and she does birthday parties and she goes to, I don't know, schools and that sort of thing. So for quite a while in Chelsea, when my, especially when my son was little, so that was a little thrilling. Um, that's what this poem is about. Um, we just see her pumping gas, dressed as a clown, colors the clown, or, or as in this poem, you know, I just see her at the grocery store, dressed as a clown, buying um, some grapefruits. Well, this poem I wrote at, uh, I don't, I'm among my, fellow Michiganders here, so I don't have to tell you of what Big Boy is. You've been there and you've had strawberry pie, I bet, so you know what time of year it is and where we, where we were. And it was the first time that my son had ever seen, it was, he was maybe three or four, ever saw Colors the Clown um, in public and, uh, or, or see, you know, seen her. And, uh, it is, it's shocking for adults. So I can, I still wonder what sort of lasting impression uh, in his subconscious, uh, the sighting of a clown at Big Boy uh, has left him with. But so this is the poem. It was summer and the clown had come to the same restaurant to which we'd come for a piece of strawberry pie, big white smile, wig of fire, the sun had begun to set with a piece of gold in its mouth. There were devils in the dumpsters eating flies. What's that? The three-year-old asked. I said, she is a clown. Time had begun to pass so fast I felt as if the weekly newspaper came to our house every day. Yet I had a photograph of myself in which I'd blown my bangs back, wanting to have wings like an angel or Farrah Fawcett when what I had was hair that made me look in this photograph like a girl who'd lived for a while in another century on a distant planet. Someday my children would laugh. She's not a woman, the three-year-old said of the clown. There were white seeds blowing around in the evening breeze without a plan, landing their fluff craft in the big boy parking lot onto the hoods of cars. A man puts a gun to your head and demands your child. What should you do? That's the kind of early summer night it was. The kind of night in which perhaps you have a last moment to look around and laugh at the child and the clown and the pie and the fact that if each atom could be collapsed into a sphere no bigger than its core, all of the Washington Monument could be crammed into a space no bigger than an eraser. How modest were your desires? In the order of things, it's true, a clown is last, but all of us are futile when it comes to want, 
and stupid to look at in a restaurant. Uh, so I'm going to read, I'm going to follow up with another um, son poem. He's uh, just returned to Scotland where he's now out of quarantine. Um, uh, he's working on his PhD. He's 25 years old now. So he's, um, he's a big boy and he's seen, he's a big boy himself, no pun intended. And uh, uh, but this is a poem uh, I wrote about him when he was little and we had been so excited to go to the children's parade. And of course, when you plan for a month to go to the children's parade, it's gonna rain like crazy. So uh, that's what happened. But the poem's called Please. He may not be in my house now, but and he may be in another country, but he's in the world with me. And that uh, that's, that's all we can do right now, be in the world together. Please stay in this world with me. There go the ships, the little buses, the sanctity, the subway, but let us stay. Every world has pain. I knew it when I brought you to this one. It's true, the rain is never stopped by the children's parade. Still, I tell you, it weakens you after a while into love. The plastic cow, the plastic barn, the fat yellow pencil, the smell of paste. Oh, I knew it wasn't perfect all along. It's tears and gravities, it's spaces and caves. As I know it again today, crossing the street, your hand in mine, heads bowed in a driving rain. Um, uh, maybe this one's a little more lighthearted, but mm, it's a different topic. Um, I had been thinking about um, beauty queens. I had I haven't watched a beauty pageant in quite a while, but I know they're still out there. And uh, when I was younger, I the um, always felt so sorry for the beauty queens who got second place or third place. Um, and, uh, and so I started thinking of names for beauty queens for the runners up and all the different kinds of names um, given to beauty queens, Miss Universe, um, and then Miss Universe, Miss USA, Miss Every Country. And this one I decided to call Miss Estrogen. To have been a storm in a suit of armor or the hound tied up outside as the fox slipped quivering through the field. To have been fever in an envelope mailed to a fire while a man in the bedroom shouted having mortally wounded himself while sharpening his own knife. like unpredictable furniture for many years. She has her period, she's madly in love, leave her alone, she's out of her mind. Or like a red carpet rolled through a forest ending at an ocean. What will become of your life without such desire? To have been the wind in the kitchen which blew the plates and bowls from the cupboards as the oven door lolled open. Or a dormouse in a wine glass, such sacred fury. Was it meaningless? Pageant in a matchbox, all the mirrors and tiaras locked up in a vault. As I scaled in my satin robe, the prison walls ran straight into the burning church in my burning stilettos. And then so many bewildered, dusty knickknacks on a shelf for sale, curios, everything must go. Once someone nodded in my direction as I did my job, She's the temporary girl here, meaning me. Once someone pointed and said, look at that wild bird in that tree. I looked too late. It had flown away to have been that bird and to become that tree. And uh, now I'll read for you um, Miss Post Apocalypse. The shoes in the garden seemed to know me by my name, emptied all of them, except for the whispering of the breeze as it blew over the emptiness and loosened their tongues. Girl, where are all your trashy little daydreams now? 
Oh, my face on the page of a magazine, curled up in the fire. Me, smiling on a big TV, worshiping a box of Tide. I couldn't bring myself to walk home beneath that monstrous cloud. I went back to the factory instead. I walked for miles, but the gate was locked. From somewhere inside, I could hear the last man on earth curse the last card as he drew it from the deck. The line in this poem, um, Girl, Where Are All Your Trashy Little Daydreams Now, comes from the Joyce Carol Oates story, Where have you? Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? And uh, I reread the story occasionally, and there's also a wonderful um, short film of it uh, with Laura Dern in it, in which the mom says that line. And uh, I forget other parts of that story, but I don't, must maybe something my mother used to say to me, it's just never has left my mind. Where are all your trashy little daydreams now? Um, I was hoping to write, you know, a, a, a sci-fi poem there, I think. Um, okay. I'll... So this uh, is again, uh, autobiographical poem. I, um, they're not kidding when they give you the directions about the dishwasher to always put your knives and forks upside down because otherwise uh, when you go to grab something out of the dishwasher, you're going to impale your hand on it if you don't do that, which I hadn't done. So um, this is called View from Glass Door. I've stood here before, just this morning. I reached into the dark of the dishwasher and stabbed my hand with a kitchen knife. Bright splash of blood on the kitchen table. Astonishing red, all that brightness inside me. My son, the Boy Scout, ran to get the first aid kit while beyond the glass door, the orchard, beyond the orchard, the garden bed, and beyond the garden, all the simple people I remember simply standing in their lines or sitting in their chairs, waiting for the film to start or for the plane to land or for the physician to call them in. How easy it would have been instead to stand up shouting about cold, dumb death. But there they waited as if the credits might begin to roll again as if the bandages, the bolts, the scrolls, the paper towels, the toilet paper. And as the family stood around considering my hand, I could clearly hear the great silenced choirs of them singing soothing songs. Who fended for and fed me, who lay beside me in the dark and stroked my head, who called me their sweetheart, their miracle child, who taught me to love by loving me, who by die dying taught me to die, covered in earth, covered in earth, on the other side of this glass door, calm, memorized faces to the sky. Um, as is often the case in families where uh, you have a first aid kit all set and ready to go in case of an emergency. Um, I had a lot of time to stare out the glass door while everyone looked for just a band-aid, forget the first aid kit at, by that time. Um, but uh, so that was that was that experience. Um, well, I'm going to read. Uh, I have a new collection of poems coming out. Uh, wasn't necessarily going to haul it out, but now I think I will. Um, uh, this I. Let me check my time here. Um, it's harder when you're on the internet to just look at your watch. Uh, so I'll read this and maybe two more poems and then uh, a couple of short ones and then we can do question and answers. But I, um, I wrote this poem. It's a little bit of a long one. I've never read it outside. I mean, out loud before, except to myself because that is what I do when I um, write a poem. Uh, you know, about 400 drafts into it, I read it out loud to myself. So it's based on, a, um, I mean, it's what I've remembered and took notes on from a Russian folk tale, but I, uh, I took a lot of liberties with it and uh, 
it's called 11 girls. So it's based on a folk tale about 11 girls um, and something similar to this happens to them. But I, uh, as I, as I let that, that story, that folk tale work on my subconscious uh, for a while, I think I, I went somewhere else with it. Uh, maybe not better. Oops, just dropped my watch in my uh, water can. This is called 11 Girls. 11 girls go to the forest to pick wildflowers. They laugh, in an old, they laugh at an old woman on the path. Imagine tall trees, thin trunks, ragged bark, pine needles, as 11 girls keep walking, how the forest grows darker, beds of needles, shady moths, and darker and darker, but all of this takes place in an innocent era with girls in forests never expecting to be raped or murdered. This takes place in some old country, maybe the one our great grandparents came from with customs, prohibitions, metrical charms, violent folk songs and nursery rhymes. So when the old woman turned around and shouted to them, hand over your souls to me, of course, the girls laughed. But when they'd stopped laughing and her hand was still held out, they saw she meant it. She was a witch or something like a witch, but she was only one and they were 11. They ran at her, tore her to shreds with their bare hands, scratched out her eyes with their fingernails, beat her with branches they broke from the trees. So when they left the forest, their baskets held not wildflowers, but scraps of that old woman instead. Gray hair down to the roots in handfuls, two eyeballs and an earlobe and a tongue. And one of the 11 girls kept for the rest of her life, a nipple to give as a wedding gift to her son, her only one, and to his bride on their wedding night. She told them she'd bitten it off with her own teeth when she was a girl, not much younger than they were how sharp her teeth had been back then. Give me your souls, she said to them. They laughed. Surely this was a joke. This was long ago, the past. It was shriveled from the beginning, but what would you expect it to look like after so many years had been given up in exchange for your soul, like wildflowers or like an old woman's nipple? Uh, my new collection coming out in the fall is uh, called Lightning Falls in Love. And um, this is the title poem, I guess, although it's not the whole title. When Lightning Falls in Love. When lightning falls in love with an old woman, sex is reinvented as the world's first toaster oven. When lightning falls in love with a middle-aged woman, lightning gives birth to an electric guitar. When lightning falls in love with a married man, his wife becomes an arsonist. When lightning falls in love with an arsonist, she gives birth to a son. When lightning falls in love with my son, I wake up to the streaking comet scream of the fire alarm in the hallway of a motel on the wrong side of an ocean. And I think, thank God, I think all this lightning has always had a plan. And if lightning can make plans, and if lightning, like lightning's plans, go on and will go on after I've gone, then my own lightning's work here is almost done. Well, now I think I'll read um, a couple of, of poems that I love by other poets. Uh, and um, this one is by a poet I love very much, Laura Jensen. As you can see, her book uh, is very well worn. Um, and the book is called Bad Boats. And this is the title poem of, from the book, Bad Boats. I'm not going to, I'm not going to explain this poem. And it's, uh, you can find it on the internet if you want to read it. And um, it needs no explanation. I think um, all we need to know is that uh, there is a human experience in, in this poem, although it pretends to be a poem about 
a boat um, or about boats. Uh, it's a human experience, a human impulse um, that, that perhaps we could say the poet is projecting onto um, these boats. Uh, the literary term for it would be the, the pathetic fallacy, which doesn't mean you know that it's not pathetic, but the a wrong a wrong uh, feeling. The feeling is wrong. I mean, would a, a bad example of a pathetic fallacy is, of course when you're in a hurry, that's when you lose your car keys. It's as though the universe has something to do with you. Um, when and sometimes it very much feels like it does, but I think science would tell us it probably doesn't. But what is the poet um, projecting onto these bad boats? They're like women because they sway. They're like men because they swagger. They're like lions because they are king here. They walk on the sea. The drifting logs are good. They're taking their punishment, but the bad boats are ready to be bad, to overturn in water, to demolish the swagger and the sway. They're bad boats because they cannot wind their own rope or guide themselves neatly close to the wharf. In their egomania, they're glad for the burden of the storm the men are shirking when they go for their coffee and yawn. They're bad boats and they hate their anchors. So you know of Richard Wright from, um, from his prose uh, more than he, uh, is known, of course, for his poetry. But he, ha I have this precious book of his of haiku that he wrote. Um, and I'm just going to read you mm, three haiku. And they, so you know, that's, if you know, you know, that's only going to be six lines, but they're three different poems. In a dank basement, a rotting sack of barley swells with sprouting grain. Two, a magnolia fell amid fighting sparrows, putting them to fight. Three, just before sunrise, after the milkman has gone, a jonquil blooms. Well, let me, I'll read one more poem of mine and then um, to try to get this exactly as we had planned to time it. And then um, we can, uh, if you want, after that, I didn't mind if you didn't want to mute yourselves anyway, but uh, if you want to unmute yourself, that would be fantastic. And I would be happy to, I don't know if I have any answers, but I'd be happy to take some questions um, if you have them. Okay, so here's another uh, uh, poem um, uh, about my son and also about eating out. <laughs> I do cook, I had, I did cook for the boy, um, but yeah, this, we're in the drive-through uh, of McDonald's in this poem and um, uh, which I should just like um, fancy feast with my cat. I should never have introduced this into the, um, into the food source because uh, nothing else was ever as great as a happy meal uh, back in the day. So he, well, before he could talk uh, or before he could read or uh, he knew those golden arches. And um, so we were, but this was right after, uh, this was right after September 11th. And um, so I had a lot of things in my mind besides this happy meal for Jack. At the bottom of the bag, there is a fact, a bit of joy, a bit of junk, which my son was issued from the womb into this world knowing. All those years, the way we lived, so much gardening in the dark, or an old blind woman sewing a tremulous rose on a tablecloth. Have a great night, the boy at the second drive through window says. He smiles like a boy who woke up only moments ago to the sound of a moth in a city made of linen. Autumn already, and the showy flowers are over, retreated into the earth, 
It simply means what it is, neither beginning nor end, regardless of the way it feels. Unlike the child in the car seat behind me, I'm old enough to remember when the television used to sign off, the star spangled banner and a flag in the wind followed by nothing but fuzz. How many nights I woke to that fuzz, a girl in the center of a dress made of electrical dust. For years, I watched the news and still I saw this world as through a shower door, steamily, and taught my child to speak of the griefs of the past in silly words and song. Boo-boo, ashes, we all fall down. But once a father bolted the doors and said to his family, we must allow our friends and neighbors to call on us no more. It is a little monster, this fact, at the bottom of the bag, this complimentary toy. And to the child behind me, it seems completely free, despite the price. Oh, happy meal, even happier, the happiest meal of our lives. No end of the world, no horizon on fire, and a blessing before I forget. I'm sorry, and a blessing before I forget. May some beautiful evening in the future find you sipping wine with your beloved in a peaceful foreign country while the lake moves full of shredded moon and tiny candlelit fish and the sound of a violin played expertly in another room and my death, if it has come, not troubling you a bit. Thank you so much for listening to me read poems and have fun reading other people's poems. And now if you would like to unmute, I would be honored to be asked questions. I have a question. Can you hear me? Wait, uh, yes, I, I heard, yes but okay. I hear your voice. I can't see okay. anybody. Okay, I mean, well, I'm, I'm Elisa. I, um, I see Bob in a, has been frozen. Everybody else is. Okay, so you can't see me, but um, in case you can, I have a hat and coat on because okay. I don't have any Elisa, heat right okay. now. I'm waiting for the repairman to show up to fix I'm my boiler. Not. Anyway, my question is not related to the poetry, but if you don't mind, I'd like to switch to um, your novels that were turned into movies. I mean, it's impressive enough to have one novel turned into a movie, but you've done more than one. So I'm curious to know, how did that, what's the process? What, how did that come to be that you had novels uh, taken up as movies? The process for that, how well, that happened? Um, it was a little bit different. Well, I, can you hear me? I oh, can. Now I can see you, I think, oh. if you're the person who asked the question. Okay. Right here, can you waving. Hear me? Okay, I just had a band go across my computer. Said your internet is unstable, but you, I'm still with you. Yes, you're still you with us. Me? Yes, yes, I can <laughs> hear you. All right, good. Okay. I can hear you are frozen. Um, well, it, I had really nothing to do with it. I didn't write the screenplays. I didn't, I have a, a, an agent for my novels. And so I don't know what agents do, but they send, you know, copies of your novels off to uh, all over the place, uh, hoping that someone will um, be interested. And I don't know. Uh, I was very surprised when my first novel was made into a film. It was a small-ish art, artistic film uh, by a Canadian director. Um, and I never heard from the director. I knew that there was, a, well, they, what they do is they um, buy the rights to it for you know, a fairly small amount of money and um, to keep it. So, and then they, but uh, I've, I mean, I've had other novels that have been optioned and lots of friends have had novels have been optioned and it's rather, it's, you know, not uncommon to have that happen, but the, usually the end of the story is it doesn't get made into a film. 
but I had no idea if it was being made into a film or not. And one day <laughs> then it was, and uh, I heard and I didn't know anything about it and just got a videotape in the mail. And I told my husband when we put it in the, you know, it was VCR, then um, I like, if I can't watch it, I just, <laughs> I'm just, I don't make me watch it if I don't want to watch it. But it, then I realized, oh, this is very flattering. I can handle this. I mean, it was just, uh, it was very, you know, it was uh, the moment where I had a kind of uh, egotistical out of body experience was when I saw the, the, you know, main character, the woman who was playing my character was holding a key that I had described in my novel that would have a cutout of a swan on it. I was like, wow, you know, these people, all these people went to all this trouble. They went and got a key made or somebody found a key that looked like a swan. So, that, and then the second one, um, the novel had been optioned, it just went on for years and years. I had totally expected that it would never be made into a film. And then well, actually we were on vacation in the UP and I got a phone call from my agent that indeed it was going to be made as a film and that Uma Thurman had, um, agreed to be the lead well be the star of it um and I still didn't really believe that it would happen until it actually happened um but so that and then the, the was the following one was um somewhat the same just uh, there's no point at which you open a bottle of champagne and say, oh, my <laughs> book's been paid into a film because it's just years and years and years of, uh, it's a very slow process, but, um, but I, but I enjoyed it. It was, uh, it, 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 the first, as I said, I had nothing to do with, and I would say the last two, I mean, last two, probably the last two, um, literally, uh, the endings of my novels already had kind of a surprise ending, but then the directors made them even more surprising. <laughs> so I, it was interesting to watch for the first time something that I wrote that surprised me at the end. <laughs> I had no idea where that was going. So, but I had, but that, except to go to the premiere, and then we also went to the set uh, when um, the Life Before Our Eyes was getting made, and saw Uma Thurman walking down the street before we got out of the cab, and. So that was very exciting. They were very nice to my son. He was little and let him sit with a, in the director's chair with the uh, headphones on and that kind of thing. Very nice. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah, I, have, I have no hints for anybody because I have other novels, but they have not been made <laughs> into films. I don't know. I, right. I have Hey, if I was a filmmaker, I think I, my novels are, I think I'm just much more interested in landscape and emotional and psychological turmoil. I don't, I was thinking, I'm just not going to make good movies. <laughs> so, but I'm not saying whether or not I think they're good movies, but <laughs> thank you. Kudos, kudos to your agent then. The key was having an agent. That's good. I have a great evening. <laughs> I have a question, unless someone else has one they want to throw out there. Go. All right. Um, Laura, I'm curious about where you get your inspiration from, um, because you write about personal experiences and you also uh, write about reflections um, or reactions to things you encounter or perhaps uh, you read. And so what, how, what inspires you? What is the trigger that would lead you to write a poem, whether it's autobiographical or if it's reflective? Well, I, I think um, my poems aren't all autobiographical, but there's something that has happened to me that I've thought about that I feel um, I mean, I think I feel a kind of relief if I can do something with experience. I have said to my students and to others who, I mean, I think everybody should write, uh, whether you want to, 
you know, published or not, that's completely up to you. But I don't know what people do with their experiences if they don't write, because uh, for me, that's my catharsis. That's what I, I, you know, life just, I feel novels are a little bit about shaping experience and inventing and changing the way things could have happened. For me, poems are more kind of, you know, sort of inner pressure, something's happened and what am I going to do with this? And, um, you know, I, uh, ooh, I, all I can think of to do is to try to shape it into something. But I mean, my poems aren't all autobiographical. <laughs> Oftentimes it starts out with a kernel of autobiography and then I mythologize myself. <laughs> it's just a fun thing to do. But I guess, you know, sort of when uh, something that has happened to me connects with something sensory, something, because I, I love figurative language and prose or in poetry, it's my favorite thing are images and metaphors. And, you know, when I can, you know, I, the, you know, my first experience of that was maybe in high school. I don't really remember when I first read Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock and Let Us Go Then You and I, when the evening is set out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. And I just thought, wow, I've seen that. Well, I'm in Michigan too. I've seen that sky when it looks like, you know, that's not when you want a little rhyme let's go the sky looks like it's in a coma but i just thought i just knew what that meant much more than any photograph of a sky or long dis prose description of a sky could ever tell me about um the emotional experience of the sky so that's you know i i write a lot more than i finish things i start i just have notebooks all over and I and I start things and uh, I'll go back to them sometimes but usually the poem just I mean it's I mean I don't just sit down and you know, whip off a great or even a decent poem it takes a revision to make it something that I would be willing to read <laughs> on the internet or in public but or to publish but I, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, I have, if I get into the right mind space and I have that combination, something, you know, that seems urgent to me to write about that I felt sentimental about, or I felt, you know, pain about, or I felt, um, I want to remember this and I can attach it to a, something, a season or a duck, you know, or um, a happy meal. And I can bring those things together. But I start a lot of poems and I never go back to them because, you know, they just don't have, they don't click. They don't have that energy. So the, in, so after I said all that, I guess what I would say is that I don't get inspired really until I'm actually writing. I, I'm just, uh, when I'm writing, I just pick up a notebook and I just start, I think, I mean, it's all ripped up. They're not pretty. I just start writing. And, um, and while I'm in the process of writing, that's when I figure it out. That's, oh, this is what I've been thinking of. This is what, oh, or I connect that. And if that doesn't happen during a first draft, I don't, it's not ever going to. So I, that, that's, Long story short, I'm inspired by the process of writing itself, but not not all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. Anyone else have anything they'd like to talk to Laura about? Elizabeth, did you want to unmute and? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, hi. Yeah, hi, Laura. That was wonderful. I just want to tell you that was such an interesting talk. I was, um, you know, really excited about hearing you. I've read some of your poems. And um, yeah, that was really interesting and fun. And I have a whole pile of questions. But um, I really have, let me just ask you quickly. Um, one is uh, your theme how we should get our news from the poets, 
right? We should get our news from poetry. Uh -huh. And uh, some of the news that you brought us, like the 11 girls in the forest, this is not good news, right? <laughs> this, is, this is pretty alarming news. So you're, you're bringing us a story. Um, and I think that's a really good idea. I think we should get our news from the poets. But how, most people don't read poetry, I have to say. Uh, you know, they don't. Um, I subscribe to The New Yorker and everyone tells oh, me that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone looks at the cartoons and then they look at the, um, you know, the, the talk of the town and then they look at the book reviews and they look at the long stories and I never hear anyone say they look at the poems and I want them to because that's where it really comes from. So how do we, how can we, should everybody learn to read poetry in school? That's my question. I finally got to my question. Um, and how would you do that? Because I know you teach poetry, but Shouldn't everybody learn to read poetry in school? Well, they should. The problem is, is that um, often I think poetry is really taught wrong, or in my opinion, I don't, I lucked out somehow having a really great um, creative writing teacher in, I mean, maybe that made it a little backward for me. I probably should have been doing a lot more reading before I started to express myself <laughs> in writing. What are you talking about in high school, in college, when? High school, in high school and high in school. college too, but in high school, I, um, in Grand Rapids, Mr. Brenner. And um, he knew a lot about contemporary poetry and he was using it to um, inspire us to write poetry. And I think it's quite, possible that you know much of what I love about poetry was inspired by him I wish I had perfect recall but I don't for, uh, for what he said but I think that uh the urge to I understand it because I teach literature uh oftentimes the people who um don't understand it and want to know you know well what is this about why isn't this prose why isn't this an essay and um and i think that as teachers a lot of times are like we want to tell you what to think and that's the wrong approach to poetry the right approach is to not to say well it doesn't you know it can mean anything to anybody it's all, all like it's all the same, um, but to say that there are certain universal experiences and um, eternal truths and, you know, uh, and sources uh, like song and, um, and uh, domestic life and nature and the seasons and the things that we eat that, that we experience similarly and I guess I would want if I could teach high school or or even earlier um, kids I would want to even before we say the word poem to just have them listen to music and tap their feet and realize that language has rhythm in the same way that music does and then you know you can bring that to the kids love that you know this is the house the jack built this is the mouse that ate the grain that lived in the house the jack built and um you know that and nursery rhymes uh rhyme and so the music of language i think would be a great place to start before you even before you even uh, have them read any poem or call it poetry and also then imagery um, to putting those two things together if you, you know if if, um, if kids could come to that but instead it's, it's often taught as an intellectual exercise which I think you know there's a time and a place for that definitely but I think more people would love poetry and read poetry if they hadn't <laughs> been punished for reading it incorrectly. <laughs> I, that's really death to poetry. Or also if they did, I mean, because it's, it's language and we, nothing is more frustrating for people than to be able to hear someone speaking to you, but not understand, I mean, not even that the, the thought is so deep or that the vocabulary is so difficult, but because 
the words don't make sense. They're not, you know, in normal sentence structure. You can't follow the thought. Nothing is more frustrating than that. And to come to poetry, not listening to the music and not mostly um, finding in it figurative language and um, suggestions for, uh, you know, emotional experiences through the sensory experience. I think it's just, a, a, I mean, I think people don't read poetry because they think they should understand it and they should. I mean, good poetry, you will understand. It will make you cry or it will make you laugh, but you'll never understand it. I mean, if you want to tell me how to change the oil in my car, please do not write me a poem. Well, <laughs> give me some instructions in a diagram. And unfortunately, a lot of us, a lot of people are taught, I think, the other way around that, oh, this is what this poem means and how come you couldn't read it? And they believe therefore that there's nothing in poetry for them. And I don't, the quote is not that we, sh uh, you know, getting the news from poetry, that it is, we cannot get the news from poetry. And um, I would say that, well, what is it? All the news that's fit to hear or read, or um, we get something besides uh, the, what we get from the information age. Instead, we are, you know, hearing from the past and the future and the present all at once. So I think news as a word there, I'm using really broadly. <laughs> so um, yeah, but you can't like, you know, you don't know who got elected from a poem. <laughs> so you don't know about the stock market, but you know about, I guess, things that I think are going to matter a lot more in 150 years than maybe what we saw on the news tonight. What about- well, That could um, be pretty okay. important too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, keep, that, that was great. Um, what about memorizing? Like, I think that's a good way to teach poetry because if you don't memorizing. memorize- Yeah, memorizing poems, because if you don't memorize them, it takes too long, in my opinion, to read them. Um, to understand them, you need to memorize them and then you can think about them as you take a walk or whatever. I think that's a good way to teach poetry, my opinion. Absolutely. I, I, I um, When I do that in writing classes, students are horrified by the idea, but then yeah. often they say that was the best thing they did, you know, that, but, um, so you're the friend of Bob's who he said <laughs> has all these, has poems memorized because I have poems memorized or I think I have them memorized until I read the poem and I realize, oh, I changed a lot of that or I forgot that. Um, but yes, I, I am that friend of Bob's and, poem, and really. I, feel, I feel like I got to know, po I, got, I feel like my education, you mentioned um, Mr. Brenner, was it? But uh, I had a teacher in junior high that forced us to memorize a poem every week. And I feel like because of him, you know, it doesn't even matter, good poem, not good poem. It was just so great. And I've done it my whole life. I love to do it. It's like a hobby. Wow. Well, <laughs> I'm, if I might, may, I'm going to start, I'm going to take that as a challenge. I'm going oh, to memorize do. it. Let's do a challenge. I used, an idea. I, I used memorize. to have contests with people, like how quick could you memorize you, a poem? Oh, I, I don't want to, I will lose that contest. No, it's just for fun. I will just be, I won't be worthy of your um, competition. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. I sound like I'm boasting and I'm not trying to, but it just, it's just fun to do. No, it's a really no, fun no, thing to do. I if I did, that's okay. <laughs> no, I'm, well, I mean, now that there's lockdown, I think, <laughs> why hadn't I thought of that? Or the, and it, maybe instead of trying to, I mean, I've been trying to get friends and students to write a poem every week. Well, well, we started that in April last year, and uh, that would uh, people got kind of burned out by June. But why not memorize a poem every week? Memorize a poem a week. Absolutely. I could get keep in my mind. 
live <laughs> much longer. <laughs> so, but uh, that's because, yeah, I mean, it's so it's internalized. And I also think, I mean, of all of us, I mean, maybe others are in the same situation. If you get stranded on a desert island, you will be able to entertain yourself. You <laughs> will. An iPhone or anything else because you have this, you have, well, so do you memorize very long poems or? I know some long poems. Yeah, I do. I have kind of categories. I have like file cabinets kind of in my mind. Like I have my Shakespeare sonnets and I have my like old poems, like my Gerard Manley Popkins poems. And, um, but I, it's another good thing about it is Laura, you can catch allusions. Like, I feel like I heard an allusion from a um, W.S. Merwin poem about the old dog. You said the old dog asking for no further explanation. That's the I name of the- No, but I mean, I've read, I worry sometimes because <laughs> I mean, I, I read things, they're amazing. Like the Joyce Carol Oates, where are all your trashy little daydreams now? <laughs> um, yeah. That stick in my head. Sometimes I think, did I write that? Or did I read that? <laughs> I mean, and I've, by now, I, I haven't memorized that much stuff, but I've read enough that I don't know where I pluck things up from. I'll stick, it on the, I'll stick it on the chat for you. Oh, it's such a perfect poem. I was going to even ask you to read it if it happened to be on top of your mind. But I feel like it, was, it, it wasn't it was that you lifted it from. It was an illusion. It yeah, seemed to me like an illusion. I'm going to just stick it on the chat. Go take somebody else's question while I do that. Talk, talk to somebody else. Very inspiring <laughs> to your question. Bob, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, in reading over your, your background, I came across this uh, quote, and I, sh I should mention, you know, I, I've spent all my life as a performer, and so I know what uh, criticism is like, because I've been subjected to much of it, and uh, a lot of it was positive, but uh, I read this about you. It said, no poet has joined the chasm of ontological despair to the pathos of household frustration so well as Kashiski at her best. My question is, did you know that about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's great. No, that, I, uh, I appreciated it though. <laughs> it's kind of cool sounding. That, um, yeah, I, I, I liked it. I, I have not yet gotten, you know, the gold um, words to made it into gold words, or I don't have the T with that on it yet. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but you know, well, but, uh, but it, especially it, when I'm not in a classroom or I'm talking to all of you, and my cat is pounding at the door now. <laughs> and, uh, I don't feel that I am doing any great work like that, but well, it's nice. But it's, to... it's interesting to think about though, the, um, the relationship between an artist, which you clearly are, and, and criticism, but even more important than criticism, uh, the people who read your work. I mean, and, and just, how that changes you when you get feedback, you know, or does it change you, or you know, and does it make you reflect back on what you've done? And you, I, I don't know how to really articulate uh, what I'm thinking, but do you know what? There is a, there is a symbiosis there, isn't there? Well, I. Um... You know, I, the way creative writing is taught now in workshop, which is all about critique, which is all about talking about the a, a poem every week uh, so in many classes. I got very, I got used to that early on, um, you know, being not over, out, out wonderful praise. <laughs> I got used to being critiqued and um, I know it did influence me I feel now where that, I mean, I, I needed that a lot for about 20 years. And now I'm to the point where if I, if I can't fix the poem, you can't tell me what I could do to make it better. And 
if if someone doesn't like it, I mean, I just, I wish it could have been better too, but I couldn't make it better. Um, but I think that, you know, having had that opportunity, getting an MFA and creative writing, going to conferences and being in writers groups um, for a period of time was really important just uh, what did I do? Did I say, you know, like I thought that I was making this kind of impression, but it came uh, and just to learn how to, um, well, just how my, how poems are read, because as you've noted, I mean, people don't read that much poetry anyway. I don't walk down the street and people don't say, oh, well, <laughs> what have you been right? let us hear a new poem of yours <laughs> it's not it's poetry the poetry world is at a great remove from me so um i think you know i i don't mind just uh not paying very much attention to that at this point it's i mean i don't just write for myself or I would not bother to try work so hard to publish things. So I'm not going to be disingenuous and say, oh, I don't care if anybody reads my poems. I mean, obviously I've tried, I've worked pretty hard to get poems published. Um, but I feel like I don't mind the mystery, oftentimes wondering what, um, what what others I don't care if the a poem's misread I just hope that it had you know something was heard something was recognized some you know this the divide between myself and whoever's out there reading um has been made a little bit smaller yeah that's good that's As a, a, it's a good question but I mean yeah, but see, as a musician, you would audition and be ranked or sent away or brought on and praised. As a poet, uh, you know, I've learned myself from writing about poetry, how subjective uh, taste in it is. Um, and, and, it, I mean, it really, I mean, I teach it, I publish, but I still, I'm still like, I'm still the fifth grader who wrote a poem about a leaf. And I was horrified when my teacher read it out loud to the class because that was just me and the poem. And I um, had to turn it in because it was an assignment, but I, I mean, I, I, am not unhappy to not pay a lot of attention to to what other people say or think of my poems. <laughs> I think a lot of it is also uh, just where you are in life. I mean, as a as a musician Definitely, now, yeah. I, mean, I I am convinced now that I know how music should go. <laughs> Certain pieces should go like this, whereas. I wasn't quite as sure earlier in my life, you know, and I would sometimes uh, bend with the musical wind, so to speak, you know, but now I, I'm absolutely sure, although I'm open to suggestion, but I'm sure that I can convince whoever's trying to convince me, you know, um, it's, it's a very comfortable stage to be in, I find, to not really care what a critic might have to say or yeah. even, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, and also to feel as though, well, I I hope that I have some more time ahead of me. If I don't, the surprise will be on me. <laughs> but if I do, I hope that the things that I fail to do, I'm trying, but I can't. Like I I don't I don't have any ideology about poetry. I'm not trying to um, follow some arbitrary set of rules I made up myself or anything. So I am working it. I'm, it's the best I can do. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
Right. Does anyone else have um, a question or a comment? I see that um, Elizabeth did post a poem in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in looking at that, please um, feel free to look at the poem that she's posted there. And I think your question was answered. The angel poem was by Jean Valentine. Is that right? Just checking that. And a quick question. Yeah. Um, uh, Laura, are you writing another novel? Or are you doing all poetry now? I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm and that's, I'm on leave this semester. I didn't know it was going to be locked down and leave. <laughs> right. I thought I could go to Starbucks, but I'm, I, I'm trying hard to finish a new novel. So oh, great. Great. it's okay. uh, in kind of that state where it's like a, all days never end now. And this will either be a disaster and a waste of four years of my life, or maybe it's an okay <laughs> novel, and I don't know yet. <laughs> I start reading, I start revising it, and I forget, who are these people? What is their problem? <laughs> <laughs> so how will it ever end? <laughs> Thank good you luck. for asking that. Yeah, sure. Good, good luck. Well, so I will really, this is, I've talked now to more people people tonight than I have in about a week so <laughs> I'm very happy to have been part of it thank you so much for inviting me and uh well I hope well, thank I you can... thank you so much we we very much appreciate it yes Laura it's been delightful having you here and well, may I uh please uh, mention to all to all of the locals that are uh, with us tonight that your books of poetry and your novels are available at the book nook in Java shop here up here in Montague. So feel free to drop in and buy her books, oh, okay? So uh, so oh. once oh. once again, thank you so much, Laura. You're just a delight and it was a joy to hear your work. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, we're almost uh, out of here. Um, so and we um, make sure um, the lecture series does continue for the rest of the winter. Um, so our next um, next lecture will be on February 23rd with Thomas Wickman. Um, so please tune in for that. You'll register yes. similarly as you did um, at the metal calendar. Um, may I, may I just, in, may I interject for a minute? Uh, the Tom Wickman lecture will be very, very interesting. It's on, Tom is an expert on the human voice and singing. And it's going to be on the golden era of the voice, which was in the early 1900s. And um, another special little kick to this story is that Tom Wickman, who is internationally recognized, was born, raised, and educated in Muskegon. So it's, it's a remarkable journey he's been on. And it'd be wonderful for you all to come listen to it. Sorry, run on, but nope, you're good. Thank you, everybody. We'll we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.